Hi, good evening. I'm Lonnie Stonich, the Executive Director of FAN. We're a nonprofit that presents programming exploring human development across the lifespan. I'm honored to welcome you to tonight's conversation between Dan Michelson and Sarah Alter. Thanks for joining us tonight. FAN's YouTube channel has an archive of over 300 videos of past events, so be sure to subscribe to the channel to get updates when new recordings are posted. And now for a few introductions. Dan Michelson is the founder and CEO of In Common, a for-purpose company that helps companies turn culture into a strategy that drives productivity and engagement. From 2012 to 2022, Dan served as the CEO of Strata, 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 a 500-person tech company with a mission to help heal healthcare. Prior to Strata, he spent a decade as the chief marketing officer of Allscripts, a global leader in healthcare technology. He helped grow that company from 100 to 6,000 employees. Dan, I think I need your help getting doing some hiring over here at FAN. And over $1 billion, and, and that part too, in annual revenue. Sarah Alter is a national thought leader and role model in the workplace, serving for six years as the CEO of Next Up, the largest network of executive women in the country. Another person I know, I'm glad I have her email address. In her time as CEO, Next Up grew to over 18,000 members, including half of Fortune 500 companies. Ooh. Sarah's career includes over 25 years in leadership roles, transforming Fortune 500 organizations by building and rebuilding company growth strategies, as well as brand and customer experience journeys. And now let's welcome Dan Michelson and Sarah Alter. Well, thank you, Lonnie. It It is such a pleasure and honor to be here tonight. And I want to thank FAN, the, the Family Action Network, for welcoming both Dan Michelson and I. And most importantly, I want to thank everybody who is joining us um, tonight. I can assure you, you will not be disappointed by this conversation. We're shining the spotlight tonight on Dan Michelson. And he is an incredible author. And in full transparency, I have to share, he has been a friend for several years. So I know that he is also just an amazing leader, as you've already heard, and just an incredible person. So I could think of no better way, other than watching the State of the Union address, of course, <laughs> than you know, spending this hour to um, chat with Dan and 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 to share this gift. And this gift is this incredible book, Holy Shift, Moving Your Company Forward to the Future of Work. Now, for those of you that have already had the joy and pleasure of reading the book, fantastic. Um, you're going to enjoy this conversation all the more. We're going to unpack it to an even greater detail. For those of you that haven't, fear not, because you can still buy it. I believe there are some links that are going to be shared where you can buy it from our preferred partner, the bookstall in Winneka, my favorite bookstore. Um, and then there are other channels where you can purchase it as well. And you will love it. And it has received just tremendous accolades and reviews. It was number one on Amazon. Um, there's been great PR coverage in Sirius XM and Forbes and Fans Fast Company. I believe even Mark Zuckerberg's sister, Randy, has been speaking accolades of this book and referencing it as well. So it's a must read. So please go out and buy it and enjoy it. But tonight we'll just give you but a taste. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, Dan That's and I, in our, in our preparation, oh, 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 what, what? <laughs> just a taste. <laughs> so, so Dan and I, um, you, you can tell this is going to be a fun chat and conversation. <laughs> um, so Dan and I, in our preparation said, hey, we, we need to set the stage for you know, why did Dan even write this book? You know, why did he name it as he did? And and really, why is this conversation so important, you know, to all of you? And, you know, for me, I, I was reflecting today and I, I thought, oh, my God, like next week, four years ago this month, we all got sent home and we had to start the quarantine process, right? And we had to pivot, we had to shift, like we had to radically change our lives. And, and it literally flash forward, we're still living in this per perpetual state of never normal. 
And, and so as Dan will share, I think that was kind of the beginning of this journey for him. You know, we, we were both sharing, okay, well, where were we at in, in this incredible, you know, time of transformation? I had the great fortune of being the CEO of Next Step. But we walked into the pandemic, we walked into the quarantine with 18,000 members who were 90% of the time used to being in person. And so overnight, we literally had to radically transform how we engaged our community in the virtual world. You know, as you've heard, Dan, you know, kick-ass executive CEO, you know, leading and, and guiding Chicago's fastest growing tech company. Um, you know, top ratings from his entire team, you know, riding high and then chaos descends. Or as I used to say, you know, the world went to hell in a handbasket. Um, but or, or, we, shift, or shift happened. <laughs> yeah, or shift happened. Yeah, exactly. Um, so so we both and I'm sure all of you did, too, personally and professionally, we experienced it. And like I said, we still live in this never normal world. Yeah. So no better conversation to have to guide you both personally and professionally in how you navigate change, you know, how you tackle these obstacles and challenges as they present themselves. But then even more importantly in the business world, how you guide your team through it. And sometimes that is easier said than done. So, so with that, um, we're going to dive into our conversation and, and we've, as you will see, we will be sharing a framework. We will be sharing strategies. There'll be, you know, tactics and actions that you can take away and apply to your leadership role or within your company, or quite frankly, even in, in your own life, because, it's it's as much you know how you guide your family through change as you do you know your professional world and and we'll touch on that a little bit too. Um, so there are three core sections that you're going to hear us talk about, and these are those three core themes or steps that as a leader you need to dive into to be successful in in, in adopting you know what Dan is, has, is is sharing in this book. And we'll start with the first, which is see the shift. So so Dan knows I was going to start with this. Um, it's one of my favorite quotes from his book, but the barns burnt down, so now I can see the moon. Yeah. Well, let's so, let's. Um, what, let what's really, behind that, Dan? <laughs> yeah, so a couple, a couple things. Like, one is um, just wanted to thank uh, Sarah. You know, so Sarah is probably well respected, and um, you've heard her background, so I won't uh, embarrass her. Um, so that's one thing I wanted to say. Just a big shout out and thank you to Sarah because uh, she's somebody who not only women but men executives look to, not just across the country but across the world for guidance. Um, so this is a, a conversation. This isn't a presentation today. That's number one. Number two is relative to the book, just so everyone's clear, um, all the proceeds are donated to Feeding America. Um, this book was really written because something that I was feeling and that I felt like I needed to get some validation on uh, to see if I was alone in this journey. So just taking a quick, quick step back. Um, so I am from the Northern Illinois area. And, um, you know, when I thought um, uh, just about like maybe what we should share tonight. The main thing I wanted to share up front is maybe just a little bit about me, um, just so you can understand kind of like why me, like why, why is this, you know, something that really matters to me. And the thing that I would just give you is maybe a lens is, um, uh, you know, I think we're going through maybe the biggest and fastest change in the history of work. Um, so this is the first time in history human history, uh, that work is no longer defined as a time and a place. Like I'm going to work at this time at this place. Um, and that's true for our, our children. That's true for us. Um, and obviously it's going to be true for future generations. So this was something that I was going through in terms of running and scaling my company. Um, just so everybody understands, this was a company that was born out of uh, University of Illinois. Uh, I had about 50 people when I got there. So it was a private equity backed company. Um, they had a close to 50% employee turnover the year before I got there. Over the next 10 years, we turned it into one of the top 20 companies in the world on Glassdoor, which for those of you who don't know, 
Glassdoor is essentially the gold standard with employees evaluating their workplace. Uh, so we really had kind of taken this incredible journey only to hit the wall during COVID. Initially, um, our employees really embraced it. Um, we actually were a high performing company and did quite well uh, during that time period. Um, but the great resignation hit and all of a sudden we st- the wall started to fall uh, and, uh, and we kind of descended. And I'm like, man, if I'm going through this, I think maybe other people are. So I set out to do research with a couple thousand CEOs, which we could talk more about across um, 100 different countries and 50 different industries, just to get a sense for what's happening in this moment. And here's the cool thing. Um, we're all living it together. Um, so uh, it doesn't matter what country, what industry, what part of the world, uh, if you're early in your career, if you're late in your career, it doesn't make a difference. This is a universal experience, this transition that we're all going through. And that's why it's called holy shift. Like, wow, what a big change. And you can make a decision at that point. You can either embrace it, right, or you can fight it. Um, that's how, how change works. Um, so for me, um, I thought this was maybe the opportunity of a lifetime uh, for leaders to lead. And that's really why I wrote the book, um, is, is more of an optimistic or pragmatic uh, take on the moment. And uh, what we can do to lever it, not only for ourselves, um, in our own careers, our own companies, but also for our kids. Um, the one thing, one of the many things uh, Sarah and I have in common is our, our, you know, during COVID, our kids went through school and then out into the working world. Um, so they're experiencing this moment in a very different way uh, than we did, at least from a context of how we uh, initially came into the world of work, right? So anyways, just a little context before we jump in. So... Barnes burnt down. Yeah, I got to get back to that. Unpack so, that one for us. Yeah. So, uh, so I, you know, just a little bit about um, my personal context. And I know I give you some business context. Is um, I had this experience when I was growing up um, that wasn't uh, necessarily initially seen as a gift, but it became that later in my life. Um, so when I was about a year old, uh, my parents got divorced. Essentially. My father wanted to put me and my sister up for adoption. And my mom said, I won't say what she said, um, but that was pretty much the end of the marriage. And um, from there at the moment, my mom was an unemployed school teacher with a few hundred dollars in her bank account and two kids. Um, so not, not a great place to start in life. Um, but because of that gift, if you want to call it that, um, I lost a father, but I gained a dad. Uh, so my mom got remarried to a screw salesman from Fort Wayne, Indiana. And uh, that became, he became my dad. Even though I had a lot of anger and animosity and a really difficult time uh, growing up, eventually we, um, you know, I kind of got over myself. I was about to say we, but I kind of got over myself. And by the time I got married, he was the best man in my wedding because he was the best man in my life. Um, so the reason I tell you that is this. Um, something bad could happen. The barns burnt down, right? But now you can see the moon, right? So you can see the uh, something bigger. There's something better out there. And obviously, you know, uh, losing a father, um, even if it's through divorce, is not something you would wish upon anyone. But there is something that you take from that um, that potentially, you know, moves you forward. And for me, that was two things, Sarah. One was um, pragmatism, right? So you know, it wasn't me, it wasn't my fault. That's how children of divorce feel, but that's not right. It, it, it's about them, right? It's about the parents. It's not about the children, obviously. Um, so that's pragmatism to me. And then optimism is like, yeah. And even though this bad thing happened, right? Something good could be right around the corner. And that's how I really looked at this moment for all of us is I think this is an incredible opportunity, even though I'm cognizant of the challenges. So it's not like, you know, people say toxic positivity. I agree with that. This isn't about being positive. Positive is saying that's a bad thing. No, it's actually a good thing. Optimism is saying, hey, this is a really challenging thing. Let's acknowledge that, right? Let's give each other some grace and let's now embrace it and and create something better together. So holy shift then how how did that speak to you because it the, the the whole crux of 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 the book right is is managing change right significant change 
How does Holy Shift tie back to that then? Yeah, I mean, honestly, it was, it was how I felt at the time. It was like holy something else. And, um, but, you know, that's the negative, right? Um, this is a tough moment and it has been tough for the last couple of years. Anyone who's run a company or been in management or leadership or anybody else, like this is, this is kind of hard to get your head around, you know, what's been happening. And even for people who have, let's say, shifted uh, to, um, to working at home uh, three or five days a week, right? Um, there's some good that comes with it, but there's also some challenges, right? I mean, like isolation, not being around people. Everyone knows there's a direct correlation between isolation and depression. Um, and at the time, I was seeing that uh, with, you know, people who were older, obviously, I won't get specific here. Um, but, you know, people I knew who, um, you know, were alone during COVID, um, obviously, that was extremely difficult, and it still remains today. And then for children in high school and college, we all know the numbers. A one out of every two kids is suffering from anxiety and or depression. And one of the anecdotes for that is connection, right? And um, bringing them together with other people. So I really looked at this moment as instead of like, how do we bring people back quote, to the office or just in general? The question is, how do we bring people forward to the future? That's the shift that I was speaking of, right? Is let's make a holy shift out of this moment um, a great and embrace it as a, a positive find the things that we can lever to improve not only our work lives, but our personal lives uh, to bring it together, um, you know, and move us forward. So, so I know that sounds, sounds high level, but we can get into the detail as we go here. Yeah, absolutely. So, so let's shift into the framework. And, and as I'd shared, there's, there's three core themes or steps that the leader has to navigate and guide the organization through. And we're going to kick it off with the first one, which is see the shift. And, and embedded in, in that whole section, there are a number of chapters, every single chapter, fantastic. Um, but it kicks off with that, how work works. Let's talk through your concept of that. Yeah. So what, one of the things that I took on was sort of the, the history of work, right? <laughs> so if you went back to the very beginning of time, um, how has work been organized, right? So I'm going to give you a quick 2.5 million year summary in a minute. Um, so we were hunters and gatherers. And basically the way that's where we lived is where we worked, right? So when we ran out of food, we moved somewhere else, right? So that was the Stone Age. <laughs> and then we went to the agricultural age and we were farmers. So we worked and lived on the farm. So we worked where we lived. Um, then uh, we kind of moved into the industrial age, and which was only, quite frankly, um, 100 years ago. Uh, so this is like one of the fun facts from doing this research. It was only 100 years ago that the number of people working in the industrial sector exceeded the number of people working in the agricultural sector. That's amazing. We stop and think about it. So this is kind of a recent uh, a recent phenomenon, even though the industrial age was going on for a couple hundred years, um, it, that was the moment. It was about 1920 uh, when that started to shift. But think about what was happening at that time. People moved from farms to factory towns. And so once again, they were still, their life was centered around work. Then we moved to the information age. Same thing. We had suburbs, right, where we could commute to work. Um, but still, we were in the proximity of our workplace. All of a sudden, one moment. 24 hours, that shift started to happen, right? And no longer was work defined that way. So the stats that I'll, I'll share with you is that um, pre-COVID, 18 out of every 100 people in the world uh, worked primarily out of an office or workplace, right? So they weren't in a hospital. They weren't in an office. They were Their work was being done somewhere else. Literally two years later, right? 54%, so tripled the number of people who primarily do the work outside of the, uh, outside of the office. So even for those of us who spend some time in the office, we're working it out. It's kind of all, it all comes together, you know, into one flow, you know, at this point in time. So that's the, the history of work is really, if you look at it historically, this is the first time where work isn't defined as a time and place as it always has been. And, and what you'll read is that Dan does, it's it's a very interesting section where it ties it back to other pandemics and what unfolded because of those pandemics, the bubonic plague, you know, the Spanish flu. And we won't dive into that because there's so much more that 
you know, we want to cover, but um, it's, it's the whole, Hey, we've seen this movie, <laughs> mm-hmm. you yeah. know, and look back in history and, and look at the dynamics that unfolded as a result of these major shifts or these major unexpected pandemics and use that to help guide, you know, what, you know, is going to happen and then how you respond as a leader. But let's dive into, you, you call it the collective catalyst. Speak a little bit about that. Yeah, and listen, I mean, it's very simple. Like uh, the idea behind looking at other plagues is just to see if there's some level of pattern recognition. And it turns out both of those plagues, the Spanish flu 100 years ago and the bubonic plague back in the 1300s caused major labor movements, right? Uh, so that's what we're kind of seeing and feeling now. This is a pattern that's played out over hundreds of years. Um, but if you kind of look at what's happened now with COVID, it turns out it was a major catalyst, right? It's a catalyst for change. Some of those changes we like, some of those changes maybe we don't like, um, but we all collectively experience it at the same time. And so if you think about just like even something simple, like what we're doing now on Zoom, right? We all went through a mass training exercise globally on the same technology at the same time. I mean, how is that even like, just try to wrap your head around that for a second. Um, so it's, it's pretty stunning. Um, but it, and it's opened up a lot of possibilities and opportunities for people who wouldn't have been able to have jobs that they would have otherwise had or wouldn't have been able to launch companies that they would have otherwise you know, wanted to launch. So there's some good things with it. So catalyst can be good or bad. Now, the thing with a leader, because that's what you're talking about, is when you see the change and you understand that, hey, anytime there's a catalyst, it gives you a burning platform to try to drive things forward and drive, try to drive change. In fact, it's the only thing that ever does, you know? So if there's a competitive change, a, um, you know, regulatory change, um, I don't know, a change in leadership, uh, those are the moments when change really becomes possible. Otherwise, inertia just tends to take over, you know, in anything you do, whether it's personal or professional, whether it's individual or collective, right? You're always kind of fighting against that. Um, so really the moment now is a great moment for us. If you look back maybe a thousand years from now, they'll look back at 2020, 2022, 2024 is the moment that shift really happened. And, and, and what's so key here is that as a leader, you see the shift, you recognize the change, and then you understand how did I get there? Right. Because it's, it's, you know, like I immediately just thought of, AI, right? And you hear so many people saying, oh, you've got plenty of time. Don't even need to think about it or worry about it. (laughs) You know, and that to me is like, okay, that's a short-sighted strategy. But what's key is see the shift and understand how you got there. You you talk then about the the three big shocks to the system. Let's unpack those and share those with the group too. Yeah. So, um, you know, once again, that the idea is like, let's see the shift. Let's understand what's happening. We'll come back to AI in a minute because I think that's. I know. Uh, we, we will cover that. <laughs> yeah. seems to work. But, um, you know, the first one is what I've been referring to before is like, we're no longer like living in a workflow world. We're now in a life flow world. Right. Um, so, you know, our, our, our work, our life doesn't revolve around our work they're all one thing. There isn't a home life and a work life. There's one life. And that's actually something that people have tried to talk about before, work-life balance, work-life integration. They've used all these terms. They haven't quite hit the mark of what it really is. It's just life, you know? It, and I think that the most advanced workplaces, the most advanced leaders are really recognizing that and acknowledging that, right, within their teams. The second one is what we just talked about is we've kind of gone a little bit from this factory mode, which is I got to be here at this time in this place to do this job and you'll oversee my work and I'll be able to see it visually and I will quote manage you to what's really now flex mode. And flex isn't just about, you know, two to three days a week here or there. It's really just about flexibility as a core concept in terms of how you treat employees, right? Or in terms of how you experience work. So flex, if you look at it, Next to compensation, those are the two biggest drivers of people when they look for jobs now is uh, is understanding and recognizing that. And the last one, and this is probably the biggest one from a culture perspective, and this is massive, is because we're not all together all the time anymore, 
Work is less of a collective concept and it's more of an individual experience. And the analog I'll give you is this, like my daughter went to Syracuse University, right? And um, however many students they have, let's call it 20,000, right? Um, I think it's safe to say, you know, if everyone's thinking about their kids, that, you know, sometimes things are going well in school, sometimes not. Some kids go to some schools and they love it. Some other kids go to those exact same schools and really hate it. And we would say in a second that it's not about this collective when it comes to your kid. It's all about them individually. That's the moment that we're in now regarding work is recognition that if I don't get down to that individual experience level of you and how do I improve your experience or how do I make this the best job you've ever had and the best company you've ever worked for about you for your experience, you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm not speaking to you and I'm not going to make progress with you. Um, so when I was uh, running a company, the great thing is everybody was there. So we'd have an all hands meeting and, you know, we'd have all hands events. And, you know, I felt like I had some level of influence or impact on everybody collectively, even if I didn't, you know, I felt right. That feeling is not there anymore. And a lot of people have misjudged this kind of back to work thing as, um, you know, CEOs want to get people in because they want to control them. Well, listen, there, there is a feeling amongst many about a lack of control. That's true, right? But even more intuitively, they recognize, hey, listen, you got to grow and develop. You need to be near other people. It may not have to be everything, um, but it has to be there at some point in some time. And that's where people are struggling is to find um, that healthy balance. And we'll talk more about that. Yeah. Absolutely. And I love the concept of life flow because it, it, to your point, it's always been referred to as that work-life balance. It doesn't exist. And my favorite expression, and I can't take credit for it, but I've heard it and I've adopted it. It's, it's a dance. It's a shuffle. <laughs> so I love that life flow. So let's move into that second theme then, or that second step, which is shift your mindset. And, 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 and to me, when, when I read this whole section, it, 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 the crux of it was, it's like, hey, you as a leader have to shift your perspective and, and not only yourself then, but then your team ongoing. And so there's a bunch of um, elements that you've built into this step. Um, and, and, and this is the best one, shift to the culture as the strategy. This is that whole culture eat strategy for breakfast, right? Let's speak about yeah. that. Well, well, I think, listen, I mean, there's and many people have heard this saying, um, so culture eat strategy for breakfast, what you just referred to is from Peter Drucker. So he's a big management consultant with sort of like a CEO whisper for a long time. Um, but during COVID, it, it ate it for lunch and dinner too, right? Uh, and so- yeah. Kind of and culture- all the snacks. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. In many ways, culture left the building um, you know, and, uh, you know, and culture, you know, we, we, you know, no one was there to turn the lights on and, um, and people felt that they felt very in the dark for a long time. And over time that became sort of a habit and set of habits. Right. And so now it's really a challenge or an opportunity, however you want to look at it to really figure out how to recapture that. And now the playbook that we had in the past, which is, you know, hand it over to HR and, um, you know, have events for the team and have mixers. And, you know, there was a very typical playbook around HR isn't enough. And actually it probably wasn't ever enough. You know, when you really think about it, you're not going to have a strong culture if you don't have it come from the leadership team. So instead of, uh, you know, culture is a strategy. What that really means is having a comprehensive plan around the pillars that you need to build in order to drive things methodically forward in a way that you can measure. Um, culture as a tact is, okay, HR, what are you doing this week, this month, you know, to help the team and make them feel, you know, kind of like the fun committee is the way that some people would have thought about this in the past. Um, so this is the real challenge of our time in distributed environments is how do you create that collective? And you've got to be strategic, you know, to make that happen. So, bring back to work versus bring together. And you've already referenced this, but I think that's another one of those crucial concepts that you know everybody needs to appreciate. It's not about bringing everybody back. 
it's about bringing them back together. And right. you know, as I, I saw it, you know, in, in my team and in my community, but share more with everyone on that. I just think, I mean, just think of the cognitive dissonance that people were going through because initially when people were brought back quote, uh, to the office, they're like, well, I could just do Zoom at home. Why am I commuting and disrupting my life now um, in order to come back and do what I could do somewhere else, right? So that is still what many people are experiencing and feeling is when they're you know, back in the office, they're still silent out, you know, and having, um, you know, they're literally... 99 or 90% of the work is individual to begin with, you know, so they're really having a hard time reconciling, you know, why that matters and why that's helpful. So, you know, the strategy of simply bringing people back, well, here's the, here's the uh, spoiler on this, which is unfortunate, um, you know, cause I've done a lot of work now over the last couple of years with lots of different um, companies on this. You can have a great culture where everybody's in together five days a week, or a really not so great culture, a really crappy one. Or you can have incredible culture when you're remote or maybe a really bad one, right? So that alone is a tactic. That's something you've got to make a decision. You've got to be clear on it. There was so much zigzagging over the last couple of years with so many companies that people, you know, they started to spin out of the circle because it kept spinning, right? And, you know, just in order to be able to continue to stand, you know, they had to sort of check out. You know, so we're in the middle of that kind of bring uh, people um, into the new way of working, whatever that's going to be. Very different for every company, obviously. Um, but this idea of bringing people together, well, that's something we really need to be methodical about. So if you're leading a team, the yeah. question is, is, are they getting to know each other and spend meaningful time together in a way that, um, you know, gets after what I call the triple aim. You know, the triple aim for every leadership team or every board or every manager ultimately is three metrics, right? Productive, um, our productivity, are people productive? Two, um, engaged, are people engaged? Do they want to work here? And three, retention, are they actually staying, right? And, you know, so we'll talk more about this, about the ties that really bind people to that, but it's simply not going to be the cadence of coming in. It's going to be the payoff from what happened when you're together, um, that's going to be sticky, if anything. Yeah, and it was it was interesting because as I think back on at, at Next Up, we you know partnered with you know half the Fortune 500, what Lonnie had shared, and um, the more successful leaders and organizations were the ones that were more purposeful, like more thoughtful on, okay when do I bring people back into the office? Like what roles do I bring back into the office? What activities, what meetings, you know, what days, what weeks, you know, it wasn't just this blanket. Okay. Everybody right. back in the office five days a week, they could, if they were more strategic, they could then continue to sustain some of the savings. Right. You know, and it, it, it was very apparent that that those that were everybody back five days a week, it was short-sighted. Well, and yeah. Longer now, term, it's not going to serve them well. Well, totally, uh, Sarah. So like, if you look at like the 18,000 members of, <laughs> of, uh, of Next Up, you know, that you were leading, well, yeah. mm, safe to say there's many different settings and many different, you know, kind of yeah. mechanisms, types of companies, locations, distribution of employees, that's the reality. So it's going to, it's going to be really, really different. And, you know, if you take a, like a typical remote company, I was just talking to someone today, they have 400 employees and, you know, if they, they're, they started during COVID, like they have everybody who's all over the place. Right. So when they bring people together, think about the cost of that. Let's say you were able to do it for a thousand dollars a head right, with travel and everything. That'd be pretty um, aggressive. That's $400,000 for a meeting. Um, so you do that twice a year, you know, you're coming up on a million dollars. If you don't have that built into your budget, which a lot of people don't, the same thing with physical space. A lot of companies now, they oh, after a couple of years, they just kind of took that out of their budget. And so now to put it back in, that would hit margins, that would hit, you know, a lot of, you know, other decisions that might be really hard to make relative to personnel and other places they would need to cut cost in order to bring people together in a physical space. Um, so. What's right for one company isn't necessarily what's right for another company, and that's okay. Um, but the key is recognizing um, 
the strategy that you have communicating in a way that is um, engaging, exciting, uh, seems fair, seems inclusive. Um, it's not that hard, um, but a lot of people swung and miss on it and still do. Yeah, yeah, no. So the other three um, aspects of this second course step, I'm just going to list them off because I want to move us into the third step because that's where the true meat of of um, the book is. But the other three steps are migrate as a leader from macro to micro. And basically we're saying it's it's a me versus we, right? And the impact of the manager on the employee experience. And like you said, we have to manage at that individual level, not just collectively across the board. You know, gone are the days of the, oh, but it's for the greater good, you know. <laughs> um, the second is moving from managing to coaching. And that's a big one because it's, it's it's it ties in really then to the third, which is evolving from evaluation to conversation. So it's having the ability to have candid conversations to really guide to coach and, yeah. and having these conversations more frequently. It's not just that structured. OK, once a week we'll get together or once a year I'll give you your performance evaluation, but it's being more thoughtful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So let's dive into that third step, which is make shift happen. And, and this one is where you really dive into, okay, what's that framework? Like, how do you guide your organization through change? And, um, you know, so excited to share with the audience that not only did Dan write this book, but now he is bringing it to life. He is activating these concepts and he has started a company called In Common. And we'll get into that in a little bit, but I want to share, um, you know, the core elements in this make shift happen. And he uses an acronym called CORE, which stands for community, opportunity, relationships, and experiences. So let's walk everybody through that. Yeah. So listen, I mean, this is... Um... So whether you're thinking of yourself or whether you're thinking of your kid, um, the question is what really matters? What really matters the most? And, and it kind of goes back to that triple aim I was talking about before. It, you know, from a leadership perspective, what's going to make my people, what has the highest correlation to productivity, engagement, and retention, right? So let's look at this from a data perspective, right? So we did research at, in common, uh, looked at McKinsey data, Gallup data, um, did a meta-analysis, put into a blender, poured out. What are the things that we know work and work consistently based on? And there's really four things, and that's what this core model is. It's an acronym. So the first one is community, is do I feel like I belong, right? So Sarah, we think about this, right? Like it could be where you live. It could be the school you go to. But do you feel part of it or not? If you don't, it's really easy to leave a school. It's hard to leave your friends. It's really easy to move out of a community. It's really hard to leave your neighbors. It's really easy to transition companies. Very easy now. It's hard to leave those trusted connections that you really built over time when you feel part of something. It's hard to leave something behind. That's community. Second one is opportunity. I feel like I have a future here or not, right? So I interviewed over, the, over a decade of running this company, Strata, um, I interviewed every single person that came into that company. So we had 500 on the team. So it's thousands of interviews over the course of, you know, 10 years. I also did an exit interview with everyone who left. Same things came up consistently, right? So this isn't data, it's just common sense, but opportunity. Oh, I, you know, they didn't feel like they had a future. Uh, they didn't know what their next role was. They thought there was a better opportunity somewhere else. So that's easy. Third one is relationships. That's the R. Are they trusting or toxic? The data here is overwhelming. If I have trusting relationships, I'm twice as likely to stay somewhere. If I have toxic relationships, which many people do, and all of us have had at times, um, I'm twice as likely to leave. And then lastly, it's experiences. Am I getting tangible experiences that help me grow? So I may, it may be a great opportunity. Like this company is a rocket ship and boy, they get up there and they 
future is inspiring. And I know what the next job is going to be, but I'm stuck in mud doing the same thing every day. You know, this is especially true with developers, right? They want to be working on that latest technology. Like we had to change our entire tech stack for our customers, but also for our developers. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been able to retain, much less attract talent. Um, so experiences, I get tangible experiences that help me grow. So two of those community relationships are really culture. Two of those, um, you know, opportunity and experiences are more about my career, right? So it's not just about culture and it's not just about your career. It's about both. And then two of those, uh, community and opportunity, are really driven at the corporate level, right? That's about the company ultimately at the end of the day. And then two of those are very much at the managerial level, like relationships and experiences. That's me and the small circle of people around me. Like if I could, I could work at a 50 or 500 or 5,000 or 50,000 person company. I'm only going to interact really with five, maybe 10 people a day, maybe 15, right? That's my lived experience at a company. So it turns out that 70% of someone's experience at a job is really driven by their manager, right? And that was like very disheartening for me to learn because I thought, hey, I can make this stuff happen from a leadership perspective. Mm, you can't really. If, 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 if the manager isn't really building that ecosystem around that employee, and that employee is not feeling it, that person is not just uh, being shown that they're opening it for them as well, even what, though they're not intentionally do the, doing that, that's actually what's happening. And that's a lot of us, that's for a lot of us, you know, our lived experience at work, right, is really those tight, close relationships. So that's, that's the core model, right? And uh, culture and career, and then corporate level or business or, or a company level, and then manager or, or individual level. And, and this framework to me, it connects so directly to, as you think about like the different generations that are at work, right? At, at Next Step, we, we did this fantastic um, research study with Deloitte and we focused on Gen Z. And, you know, our reality, it's the youngest and the fastest growing community or population and in, in work today, right? In, in in the workplace. And so much of what we learned was, you know, one, they didn't want to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. They wanted to go work for a larger organization because they were seeking stability. You know, they'd watched their older siblings graduate from college and not find a job. You know, they they wanted that financial stability. Which they I think for people. I don't think that they would have jumped to that. So when you told me about that, I was like, yeah, well, weird. I wasn't really expecting that. It's what they'd lived through and what they yeah. saw. And, mm -hmm. and their their perspectives and attitudes are closest to the Gen Xers um, and that they, they want a nice long and wide runway. They want to develop different skills. They want to be invested in, right? They want to be a programmer and they want to be a marketer. And what was even more interesting was they did want to come into work on their own terms because they wanted a social network, a community. They wanted to feel like they belonged. Mm -hmm. so be, I, I just love this because it really speaks to, you know, in the next step world, we were there to help advocate for diversity, for equity, for inclusion, but belonging was that newest concept. And if you can't deliver belonging, you've you've failed. And to your point, you're not going to see the satisfied employee who is productive and and stays. Belonging easier easier said than done. Yeah. Well, you know what's interesting about that, just to build on your point, Sarah, is that um, the the amount of gaslighting that's been going on generationally, right? So you um, quiet quitting would be the example, right? So oh, yeah. Gallup released this study and everyone. Oh yeah, they're by quitting. Everyone jumped to, to the conclusion that it must be the youngest uh, uh, of our employees who are who are quote quiet quitting. Turns out that's not the case. So when you look at the actual data, what they were really showing is the number of people who are quote, disengaged or actively disengaged, whatever you want to call it. And the percentage that were actively disengaged in their research was twenty percent. So not good. One out of every five employees. You know, a little disappointing, right? However you want to interpret that. Then you look at their same data set, which they didn't include in the article or the research conveniently, but you can look it up. 
You look 10 years prior, guess what? The number of people were, that were actively disengaged, 20%. So that's in 2012. Then you go back 10 more years to 2002, it's 20%. You know, so yes, we've always had this issue of people who are not engaged, right? And that's not the problem of the person. That's really a management issue at the end of the, end of the day. If you're not hiring and engaging people, you know, the right way, bringing the right people on and doing the right things with them, that's ultimately your responsibility, right? And so what was happening is a lot of people were pointing to that generation. Now, the same thing is true with what you're just saying. Like people are saying these younger people, they don't want to come back to work. Not the case, right? So just based on your research and what you did and everything that we've seen, it's like, actually, those are the folks who really want to be social, but folks who are talented with it, not surprisingly and very understandably are people with young kids and, you know, where their families have gotten into a cadence, right? That is absolutely a challenge for that, for that generation, understandably so. Right. It, it's their flight flow has now taken over. Um, so, yeah, I mean, everyone's prioritizing flexibility. I don't care if you're 50, 40, 30 or 20. That's fundamentally a, um, a feature, not a bug, you know, as we see in the software world. But, you know, if you look at it from a, hey, should you always be remote or whatever? No, of course not. Like you learn from being side by side with people. So, even if it's uncomfortable for you, even if it requires an effort, ultimately that's the thing that's going to help catalyze your career. Uh, you learn from two things. <laughs> Unfortunately, they're related to the same thing. You learn from your own experience and the experience of others. So you learn from experience, right? And I kind of use the analog um, experiences like marbles in a jar. You have a good experience, put a marble in a jar. You have a bad experience, put a marble in a jar. Keep putting as many marbles in the jar as you possibly can. Make that jar full. That's the key to really growing, you know, professionally, personally over time. You know, put as many, fill as many jars as you can, or make it, get a big jar and put as many marbles in as you can. But even if it's a bad experience, great, lean in. You're going to learn from that moment more than you would probably if it didn't happen, for sure. Um, so these are all kind of um, the components, like at least from my perspective and what the data shows you, what common sense shows you, that are the essential elements of not only the employee experience, but what really drives productivity, engagement, or retention for a company. See the shift, shift your mindset, and make shift happen. So again, when you when you read the book, Dan just does such an excellent job of you know, laying out within each one of these steps, you know, what you need to be mindful of as a leader and, you know, and what actions you can take. Let's wrap it up with X marks the spot. Yeah. So um, if I can like pivot my camera, you'd see on my wall, I got a, I have a big X. Uh, so that goes to, uh, <laughs> That's new. <laughs> yeah. So uh, let me explain that. So um, as I said, I struggled with many things growing up, um, not only what happened uh, with my father, um, but also I was uh, dyslexic, um, constantly bullied. Like I had a lot of issues growing up. So this is therapy. I'm working through it right now between this conversation and the book. Um, I'll, but I'll, send I, you, I'll send you my bill. Okay. Yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> but, but because of that, you know, I started like really getting consumed with certain like mantras or quotes and things that um, I found. Um, you know, uh, whether it was in music or whether it was, you know, somewhere else, something that really kind of explained a universal truth to me. And one was this quote, X marks the spot, the rest of your life begins today. Now, when you hear that quote, it may mean different things to different people. What it meant to me was that, you know, good or bad, anything that's happened before this moment is behind you. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, where do you go with it from here? And good things can be a crutch as well as bad things, right? Um, you know, some people, you know, because things have worked in the past or they've done things a certain way, they've continued to do those things. And that can actually work against you. With AI, which we really didn't talk a lot about, it's working against a lot of people who are very far in their career who view it as a threat, right? Um, so success, you know, in any measure um, can be uh, an inhibitor to growth. Um, but also, obviously, bad things can be really challenging, too. But, you know, the reality is whatever happened, it's behind you now. 
The question is, what do you do from here? And so that's the rest of your life begins today. Um, that's a quote that I would use on every presentation, every time um, I started at a company. Is the first slide I would show is just the next. And I would explain that, like anything the company has done up to this moment or you think you've done personally, wonderful, right? Or I know it's been hard, you know, there's good and there's bad, but either way, let's use that as a, um, as a step, you know, and let's take the next one. Um, and the question is, where do we go from here? Um, so that's really the closing of the book is, you know, regardless of the last couple of years and how challenging it's been, uh, not only from workplace, but, you know, socially, politically, and otherwise, you know, um, I'm going to be pragmatic and optimistic. You know, I, it's, it's, yeah, it's challenging, but, you know, there's better things ahead. We have to bring those forward as leaders, you know, in this generation, our generation um, really has to step up in a bigger way than we have, you know, to kind of lead forward. So, so much of what you're laying out is, is the groundwork, you know, the principles for, you know, navigating change and for being more, you know, human focused or human centered, you know, as a leader and organization. Um, I think a great question to end this with is how do you make sure though, that you don't lose sight of like the real business results, the productivity, the, and, and I know this is a loaded question because having been in the world I was in, you know, it, it was, it was DEIB. So I can't tell you how many times I was asked, well, how does this help deliver results, Sarah? Um, so answer that question for us. Cause I'm sure, you know, you, you'll, you'll, if not already, you'll face this question many times forward. How does this deliver business results and not deter from productivity? Yeah. Well, the, the nice thing is with what I've been sharing, it actually directly correlates to productivity. So you can look at the data and you can see the impact that it has. Right. And so there's just a lot that's very, very basic that we tend to miss. The workplace has become very transactional and transitional. Obviously, that's not a good thing uh, for building a company, right? And growing a company that can be very challenging. Um, restoring pride and purpose in work, right? Has an extremely big impact on how productive I am, how engaged I am, and whether I stay or I don't. And actually, once again, this isn't just common sense, but the data actually shows it. So we kind of transitioned. And this is what I was going to say about AI is, you know, people are intimidated by artificial intelligence or very excited about it. And there's some people who are in between, but people, I see them at those two extremes. Yeah. In some ways, uh, we're kind of entering an era where authentic intelligence matters more. Um, intelligence, the way that it used to be kind of looked at was the retention of facts or, you know, the ability to, you know, whatever, um, you know, kind of what we've been traditionally taught in school. Um, but now, absolutely, you can get that through Google. Absolutely, you can get that through AI. And those things are extremely wonderful engines, if you want to call them that, just like a calculator was back in the day. But authentic intelligence, what I call the superpower skills, what some people call soft skills, are going to become much more critical in terms of not only leadership, but also anybody at any time working in any company. And those are the things that we're going to have to cater to. And a lot of those tie to your ability to bring people in your community, um, to show them the future opportunity to get them excited about it. So they want to be part of it, uh, to build those trusting relationships, which is where the biggest gap is right now uh, with leaders in their team, and then give people tangible experiences, not just training, but experiences that are helping them grow the same all of us experienced in terms of our growth. That's what we owe to the next generation. So with the little time we have left, um, speak about in common. Oh, well, I know we're going to go jump over to some questions, but long story short, um, really what we've tried to create in common is a software platform. And I don't want to make this commercial, but just being very rational, uh, where we take um, Think of it like a third place. Uh, if you ever heard of Starbucks strategy, there's work, there's home, and there's Starbucks. That was their strategy for 30 years. Uh, in the workplace, you had the ability to stop by someone's desk. That's how you would chat with them. Now you can use Slack or, um, or, or Microsoft Teams for that. Um, then we used to go into meeting rooms and spend time with people. Well, now we can do this, go on Zoom. And even though we get fatigued, uh, it's not going anywhere. 
but those casual conversations, the you know cooler conversations, the uh, the water cooler conversations, the uh, the kitchen, the um, you know the hallway, those things are missing. And so, really, that third place—that's what we built as a platform that brings people together in a third place called the Commons, uh, where they can meet people, um, find mentors, um, jump into real-time conversations, and a whole variety of other things. But let's uh, let's jump over to the questions. Yeah. Hey, there you are. Um, Sarah, thanks for a really great, thoughtful, Dan, you were so supported in your conversation with Sarah. She obviously <laughs> knows, knows the content, knows the book, is a big fan, and that's always um, obviously very helpful for you and helpful for the program. So thank you, Sarah, for that really great preparation. We really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure thank to you. you. Thank you, Lonnie, for having me. Oh, it's our it's our pleasure. It's glad that glad to have you in the family. Um, uh, there were a couple questions that were submitted through the Zoom registration form. No one had submitted a question during the event, so uh, maybe it's because you're so thorough and everything is answered, so that's fine too. Uh, I am going to pivot to one of those questions. First of all, actually, I want to remind people, sorry, about coming to After Hours. Um, both Dan and Sarah will be at After Hours. We've been putting in links in chat. There's one there right now uh, to purchase a copy of Dan's book from the bookstall. A reminder that all um, proceeds from the book are going to Feeding America. So Feeding America, correct? Yes. Correct name. Okay. I didn't have it written down and I was pulling it from memory. So I just want to make sure I, I referenced the right organization. Uh, so all proceeds go there. Uh, so buy a copy. Come hang out with Dan and Sarah. We're going to continue the conversation, ask some questions there as well, get some insights. Um, so I'm going to pose a question here from Catherine in Highland Park that was submitted ahead of time. We got about two minutes um, she says, uh, and it's not surprising, we have a lot of uh, schools, we have 70 schools part of FAN, so a lot of parents. Um, and she's wondering, what industry should our younger people focus on for their careers in the future workspace? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I'm actually going to turn it to Sarah first, because uh, she's had a lot of exposure to this. Okay. Um, you know, I, I these days, I'm, I'm saying technology <laughs> And it's funny, I gave that advice to all three of our kids when they were in college. I was like, look, you can major in whatever you want, but in parallel, you need to take as many technology classes as you can. And, and you know, and and really in general, it's anywhere there's growth is, is really where you should be looking. But right now, healthcare or technology would be my two recommendations. Yeah, the one thing is I'll say, you know, a year out of school, I was you know pretty lost in terms of what I wanted to do professionally. So I had my first job out of school. I was actually selling copiers door to door. So it wasn't like the most glamorous job in the world. Uh, <laughs> so, um, you know, instead of looking for a company, I looked for an industry. And I said, like, where could I make an impact over time on something that's meaningful, um, that's, a, you know, a stable industry uh, where there's lots of opportunity, but also lots of problems. And uh, that's how I started my career around healthcare. So I, I worked in healthcare for three decades, all because of those components. And, you know, so if you pick something, you know, that is um, maybe not a passion, but more sense of a purpose, right? Um, in terms of what you're going to do. And a lot of people say that, but if you just break down what that really means is, Listen, I want to I want to help people grow. Oh, great! You want to be a teacher. Um, I want to care for people. Oh, great! You want maybe want to be in healthcare. I like whatever brings you. Like, man, I feel really good when I do fill in the blank. Like one of the things I've always loved to do, Lonnie, is write. Right, writing a book was really hard. That's a whole different uh, you know, session. And uh, you know, I wanted to quit many times and actually did. You know, but ultimately, every word in that book is you know came from me. And something that I'm really proud of. Actually, the cover of the book uh, was designed by my daughter after we rejected what came back from the publisher. Um, so it was really a homegrown exercise, you know, at the end of the day. Um, but you know what? It's like um, if you're artistic and you want to put art into the world, that's great. If you're uh, from a technology standpoint, that is a palette, you know, is the way I look at it, Sarah, yeah. to solve problems. Uh, what you can do with artificial intelligence now is either great or scary. Right. Yep. And so I would just say lean towards great, um, but you can't run away from the tools. Uh, there are things that can repel you forward and you got to lean in um, and right. take advantage of them. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, great information. There's I know where there's going to be um, both of you. Great resources for after hours. Come and ask more questions. Pick the brains of these two people who have built a lot between the two of them. 
Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Hope to welcome you back to FAN next week. We're doing Jared Cohen on Monday. It's going to be fascinating listening to him talk about past presidents and what they did after power. That's going to be quite a, kind of funny. Um, so thank you so much, Dan and Sarah. And we'll see you in about five minutes, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight.